This is rumor. Okay, so let's see. I don't often talk about like books that I'm reading, um, which it's kind of odd. You'd think that I would being a writer, editor, books being my jam. But um, yeah, I guess I don't too much. Maybe because I'm ashamed of how not much I read these days uh, because I'm a writer and an editor. Um, it's kind of sad to say, but honestly, those occupations kind of killed reading for me for a time, at least reading fiction. I made a big shift to nonfiction, and that was when I really got into like crystals and tarot and going down the rabbit hole with that. And I, yeah, I just, I just kind of needed to shift into something else because it's really different to read fiction um, when you're otherwise so like deeply in a story and working through it and revising it. Um, it's hard to not read a finished work and keep mentally doing the same thing and it drives me crazy. But I've been trying to focus on the books I already have had, <laughs> I've been meaning to read for ages. So um, one that I just recently finished was To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And I am currently reading Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Um, and this one is very cool. Uh, I, I, I love the structure of it. It's divided into different sections based on this main character having four different notebooks that she writes in. Let me just read here. In one with a black cover, she reviews the African experience of her earlier years. In a red one, she records her political life, her disillusionment with communism. In a yellow one, she writes a novel in which the heroine relives part of her own experience. And in a blue one, she keeps a personal diary. Finally, in love with an American writer and threatened with insanity, Anna tries to bring the threads of all four books together in a golden notebook. And then what is in the notebooks follows what is basically a story about Anna, and it's just divided into different parts. So you'll get a chunk of that novel about her, and then you get a longer section going through her notebooks from her point of view. And it's really interesting. And this, I enjoyed. This was, a, I think, an experiment in writing for Virginia Woolf, where it's very free association. It just really steeps you into the detail and nuance of the moment, I guess, more than tell a story like a plot point from A to B you know it's something it's very character driven and um and I underlined some bits this one character who's actually an artist she's been trying to do this painting she started one 10 years before and um never finished it so now she's taken up her paintbrush again and she's trying to finish it. So some of the reflections um, on a section through her point of view, I really related to, and, and, and if you write or paint or produce any sort of art, I'm, I'm sure you can as well. So I just thought I would share that. But there was all the difference in the world between this planning eerily away from the canvas and actually taking her brush and making the first mark. That is completely how I felt going into this year. Like there's been so much in my head and that I've brainstormed in my notebooks and the doing though, the actual doing and, 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 and getting something committed to, well, I was going to say to paper in my case, the screen, I brainstorm on paper, but I actually write at the computer. Uh, 
yeah, that's the thing that's tough to get momentum behind sometimes. And, and it is so easy. And I can make the excuse for myself like, well, I'm not writing, but I'm thinking about it. And some things you do need to like step away for so you can work it out in your mind. But then sometimes like just the sitting and doing it, you can like untie those knots that way too. And anyway, as it says here, still the risk must be run, the mark made. So working on making my mark this year. Always before she exchanged the fluidity of life for the concentration of painting, she had a few moments of nakedness when she seemed like an unborn soul, a soul reft of body, hesitating on some windy pinnacle and exposed without protection to all the blasts of doubt. Why then did she do it? She looked at the canvas, lightly scored with running lines. It would be hung in the servants' bedrooms. It would be rolled up and stuffed under a sofa. What was the good of doing it then? And she heard some voice saying she couldn't paint, saying she couldn't create, as if she were caught up in one of those habitual currents which after a certain time forms experience in the mind so that one repeats words without being aware any longer who originally spoke them. Can't paint, can't write, she murmured monotonously, anxiously considering what her plan of attack should be for the mass loomed before her. It protruded. She felt depressing on her eyeballs. Then, as if some juice necessary for the lubrication of her faculties were spontaneously squirted, she began precariously dipping among the blues and umbers, moving her brush hither and thither, but it was now heavier and went slower, as if it had fallen in with some rhythm which was dictated to her by what she saw, so that while her hand quivered with life, this rhythm was strong enough to bear her along with it on its current. Certainly she was losing consciousness of outer things, and as she lost consciousness of outer things and her name and her personality and her appearance, her mind kept throwing up from its depth scenes and names and sayings the me and memories and ideas, like a fountain spurting over that glaring, hideously difficult white space while she modeled it with greens and blues. And I just love that, and it actually reminded me of something that Candy read from one of my books <laughs> this year, um, much to my surprise. I didn't even know that she was reading them. I didn't know that she owned them. I had not gifted them. I was not asking for any sort of review. It was, um, I don't know, back in January or February this year, I was just watching one of her videos and she starts saying like, oh yeah, and I've been reading rumors books this year. <laughs> what? So she quoted from one though, um, one of them, is a short story compilation. And at the end, like in the appendix, I added a keynote speech that I had delivered talking about um, how I got into writing and what my writing process is like, and just giving I, you know, encouragement and advice to young writers. And um, and, and so the, the excerpt that she shared on her video was where I was talking about something along these lines, like that moment of magic that you can kind of tap into when you when you do just finally sit and do the thing um and then you do just kind of lose consciousness the consciousness that like psychs you out and makes you feel like you're not good enough that inner critic goes quiet your surroundings kind of melt away as you find yourself immersed in the world instead that you're seeking to depict the one in your imagination, and then things can just start to flow. And I've had that experience where it just feels like I'm not even the one writing it. Like it is, I'm channeling something. It's coming from somewhere else. And it's not to say it's, oh, because I think what I'm writing is so profound, but it's just sometimes I wonder like the storylines, the characters, um, I don't know. You, you almost wonder like if you're tapping into some other existence out there. Uh, some story that's just wanting to be told and you're chosen to be the one to write it. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. And it's not like that's what it feels like all the time. That's why it is so hard to stay motivated with writing because uh, it, it can just feel like a hard slog through thick mud some of the time when you really just have to kick in the discipline to get her done, to take the risk and make the mark. So um, anyway, I just really related to that. And it's just really encouraging to see you know, just know that that's kind of um, a shared experience and it's more of the flow that I'm feeling within this year now that I'm getting my gears oiled and honestly working on that spike deck was part of that process of kind of getting the momentum going and so yeah anyway 
that that's been the experience. And so now I am feeling more in flow with that. Um, so then just to quote from the very end of this book, there it was her picture. Yes. With all its greens and blues, its lines running up and across its attempt at something. It would be hung in the attic. She thought it would be destroyed. But what did it matter? She asked herself, taking up her brush again. With a sudden intensity, as if she saw it clear for a second, she drew a line there in the center. It was done. It was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue, I have had my vision. And I wonder if that's how Virginia felt when she finished this um, in achieving her vision for how she wanted to approach this story. But um, but that feeling of satisfaction, um, yeah, that's really been my goal. It takes me an eternity to write a novel. That's never something that I just complete in a year's time. It usually is spaced out just because I, I'm very on again, off again with that. Um, largely because of the editing work that I also do and travel and just other things in life. So um, it gets spread out over time, but this has been a year where I've just felt like, get her done, something, something's got to be completed. And so just feeling some sense of completion with something, uh, this is the year for that. So uh, at least to get a rough raw draft done on this manuscript that I've been nursing for a few years would be wonderful. So Related to that and other books I've been reading this year, before I was getting back into the fiction, as far as the one that I'm writing, which not literary fiction, <laughs> would be something I probably you would read on a beach. Uh, I'm not highbrow. But uh, it involves ghost hunters. Because I love ghost hunters. And like ghost hunters on TV, I'm talking about. Um, so I've been reading books by the ghost hunters that I have enjoyed watching on TV for years just to learn a bit more about their equipment <laughs> and you know and what they'll use for when and how they seem to set things up and also just the their anecdotal experiences and what they make of that and um, how they react to things and just generally how they approach it just as a bit of research for my own television ghost hunting team that I created. So, well, these are the OG guys. So I'm currently reading this. Switch on and off with these. Um, this is actually like an omnibus of two separate books written by Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson of the show Ghost Hunters. So these were like the OG television ghost hunters. And it's great. Um, talk about quick reads. I mean, they just have these short little anecdotes taken from their documentation of the different ghost hunts that they've done over the decades. And um, it's really fun. And then my favorite team, like pairing on Ghost Hunters, because they usually do go around in pairs, um, was Amy Bruni and Adam Berry. I loved them. I just, I could tell there was something very different about their approach. They just seemed a bit more emotionally connected to what they were doing as far as like addressing any present spirits as people. Um, there was a compassion that they brought that just seemed different than just trying to collect evidence. Um, and <laughs> what I like about ghost hunters is they're not like ghost adventures, like Zach Baggins or douche Baggins, as I like to call him, where they like actively antagonize the spirits. That's ridiculous. It just seems so disrespectful. And I, I, I'm saying all this and you might not even believe in ghosts. I do. <laughs> but... Because I do, I just I just have respect for them and the space it might be in and like what might be keeping a spirit grounded here. And um, well, let's just say I'm, I'm open to it. I, I can't say 100%, I believe, like we never know with these things, but, um, but I'm, I'm very open to it and I'm inclined to believe it. Let me put it that way. So uh, I, I, I just, I, I, I respect when a ghost hunter goes in with respect. And so Amy and Adam ended up because their approach was, um, 
even different from the other ghost hunters who I feel were generally respectful. I don't think that they were too antagonistic like on Ghost Adventures. But, um, but I think they wanted to have more time to investigate a certain case um, that Ghost Hunters just didn't allow for its filming schedule. They wanted to be able to go for multiple nights at a site and, and do more research and not just again, collect evidence, but really see if they could resolve something for whether it's like homeowners just needing peace of mind. Um, they don't try to pass on spirits. Uh, they don't feel it's their business to try to send someone into the light if they don't want to do that. So not that, but just kind of trying to get down to if there's some sort of unresolved issue that maybe they could help someone find closure for, whether the living or the deceased. So that show is called Kindred Spirits, and that is my absolute favorite ghost hunting show. So Amy Bruni, who heads that up, has written this book, Life with the Afterlife. Uh, 13 thing, truths I learned about ghosts. And so she shares a lot of uh, anecdotal experience here as well as her philosophies that was amazing. And then after I had finished that, I found um, that Adam Barry had just come out with his own book. And here it is on my OG first generation Kindle. But goodbye, hello. Processing grief and understanding death through the paranormal, which... I really took to heart because over the last couple of years, I have been reading books on grief, which maybe is another reason why I don't talk about too much what I'm reading because it might not be what people want to hear about. But um, this was incredible to approach that topic with this like merging of my interest <laughs> with these paranormal investigations. And so to hear Adam's anecdotes, which sometimes overlay with Amy's because it's investigations they did together, but he's looking at it more through the lens of what he is kind of shaping and it's ever changing, ever evolving what he thinks of um, the spiritual world. Um, seemingly he believes in it, but, um, but as for what it's, what it's, like he's got these ever evolving thoughts on it. So I guess this book captures where he probably is with that now. And maybe that's something that could change down the road, but he offers it up as um, solace really. If you are missing a loved one, it, uh, it gives a peace of mind that um, they're still there in some form, um, ideally not as a grounded <laughs> spirit, AKA ghost. Um, hopefully someone who's moved on and, um, has found peace. But anyway, I, I thought it was great. He touched on not just his paranormal investigations, but he brought in other people and their, uh, experiences with, dream visitations. Um, he has an interview with Tyler Henry, who is one of my favorite celebrity mediums. I love him. There's a really good um, Netflix series with him, and I forget what the actual title is, but I watched that this year, and I just find stuff like that tremendously moving. So here's your insight into me, folks. I just, I, I love this stuff. And that's why I like to write about it too. So really excited about this book series that I'm, I'm getting started with that will actually involve paranormal investigators like this. But this was a case where this was something, you know, also part of the process of me processing my own grief. And so really, really cool. Well, oh, I'm putting the old school Kindle away to go. Oh, oh, I turned it on too soon. Virginia Woolf was on the cover or on the screen. Shoot, that was a nice synchronicity. But anyways, but I also meant to show on here. Um, one of my other recent reads was Journey of Souls. By Michael Newton, PhD. 
case studies of life between lives. I first heard about this book while I was listening to a podcast, and that's why we drink. And one of the hosts, Christine, said she was in the middle of reading this book, and when she mentioned the premise of it, I immediately went and and downloaded it, and I started reading it, and it was pretty much all I could do was read this book. I, I... I mean, my brain almost physically hurt at certain points, not because I couldn't understand. It was like hard to understand. It was because my full comprehension of it, I was just friggin' blown away. Mind blowing. Whether you want to believe in this stuff or not, I honestly, truthfully, I don't, I still don't know where I stand on it. I truly don't. But because I just do have an open mind and I'm very open to considering this as a possibility for how things are in the afterlife. I had just never read anything like this, and it it was really just fascinating. So even if you don't believe it, I just think it makes for a fascinating, fascinating read. So anyways, (laughs) the premise of it, as indicated by that um, subtitle there, uh, so... This is one of the things. Like, I don't know where I stand on reincarnation or past life regression. Open to it, though. My mind is open to it. So, this guy (laughs) is a hypnotist who does past life regressions. And that was typically what he did. People tapping into lives they've lived before. But then inadvertently, it must have been something that he said, maybe just a certain phrasing, that he inadvertently stumbled into patients' memories about their lives after they died and before they were reincarnated into another mortal lifetime. So when that started happening, he was taking note of like what he was saying, how he was getting them there. And then he ended up kind of refining and deliberately bringing patients into, or should I call them clients? Maybe patients isn't the right word bringing his clients into that space, into those memories. So it starts with the sorts of experiences that we've already heard about through those who have temporarily died but come back. So the near-death experiences. Uh, so it, it begins with that, and and the majority of what his clients say uh, jibes with what people who have experienced near death experiences have said about feeling, you know, lifted out of their body, maybe looking down and seeing themselves, um, so forth. You, you've heard these stories, but then this book goes beyond that like it it keeps following because these are not souls who went back into the body then it wasn't near death it was death a permanent death so his clients spoke about what happened as they just kept leaving and go into that next realm if there are people there to greet them what and who they see and I can't even begin to describe for you. Even if you think this is totally like crack science, <laughs> totally bogus. It's just fascinating. I mean, my God, if, if people are this um, creative and intelligent under hypnosis, like I'm, I'm, I'm in awe because honestly, some of these things that are said, I'm just like, and I'm someone who makes up stories, uh, you know, to write books. I couldn't on the spot just 
improvise, <laughs> improvise some of the stories that these people are telling. And like some of the terminology that they use is so weird and the tone that they speak through. It's just, it's so, um, it's so compelling. I just put it that way. And it's so big. Like it, it, the layers to it. I'm so glad he approaches it in the stages that he does, which kind of gets it more breaking that process between dying and then reincarnating. Um, breaking that into like digestible stages is really helpful because it is just whoosh, trying to fathom like if this is really the case I, I think it'd be amazing if it is I would like to believe that this is what actually happens it's so much more complex than I would have ever thought and almost structured although the clients under their hypnosis wouldn't describe it that way as they're speaking with their soul voice they wouldn't see it as like a structure or a hierarchy really, but, um, but it does almost seem to be something in ways that we reflect here. I, I, I kept thinking as above, so below is what kept coming to my mind. Like, oh, maybe this is why we organize schools <laughs> and corporations like the way that we do. It, it kind of felt like that. And so that could seem like a very human construct. And so Maybe people are just bringing that in from their lived human experiences. But I am just telling you, like, the way they speak of things in terms of light and color and frequency, um, it's so, the, the energy of it, um, it, it just really correlates with how I've often speculated uh other dimension to be or, 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 or that being what separates different dimensions, um, different vibrational frequencies and such. And, um, and how there could be like a consciousness, uh, in a non corporeal form, everything just being energy and, and the energy that's within us when we die scientifically proven, it has to go somewhere. We haven't proved where, but that is one thing that we do know, right? the energy can't be destroyed. So when we die, our energy goes somewhere and you can believe it just dissipates, not dissipates because it can't be destroyed, but just kind of like filters through the air. And I don't know. Um, or if you think that that consciousness stays intact, I mean, that's the great divide, right? In people's beliefs on this sort of thing. And so if you believe in the latter, the consciousness that survives the body, then I think you'd really enjoy this book. And again, it also relies on a belief in, um, or at least an open-mindedness to entertain the idea of reincarnation and um, the idea of souls choosing to come back um, to kind of like level up in their evolution as a soul. And anyways, I came out of that experience feeling like not what you would think. Because <laughs> um, for as much as I say like, oh, I hope that that's how it is. It's, I didn't finish it feeling like, oh, I just want to be there. Like done with the trouble and the toil of this world. And I want to be there and just feeling love and um and being with those other souls in love and uh and but there's so much more to it than that that sounds like super cheesy but i mean it, it, it it's a whole thing it's a whole complex thing that these people claim you go through um and meeting with your guides and just kind of like the education that you receive and choosing you know picking out what your next life is going to be and um it's just it's really cool but anyway, like reading about it, I was just kind of like, oh, I, I came out of it feeling like I actually, I'm glad to be where I'm at right now. Um, I, I feel at peace if, if that could be a glimpse into what it's like, um, then great. That'd be wonderful. And I know that like, I'll be happy to be there when the time comes. That's good to know. But it, it kind of left me with this appreciation for this 
corporeal life. Um, Cause you know, I like watching TV. I like eating bread and cheese and drinking coffee. I like watching the birds and hearing them sing. I like walking in nature and tapping into all of my senses in this physical world that I move through. And those are the things you don't get on that other side. So it made me really appreciate why a soul chooses to be here beyond just that greater evolutionary purpose. There's a sense that they want to be here. Our souls want to be here because there's something really special about getting to live in this life. Um, even with the toils, there's something to the physicality of it and the scents and sounds and feelings of things. And um, yeah, and I guess it made me a, a feel an appreciation too, that if that is that choice, like, well, you know, especially coming out of these last couple of years where I was feeling a little bit, um, I don't want to say deadened, but just kind of numbed, um, just kind of living a half life. It made me really feel like, you know, I'm here for a reason that doesn't have to be a big grand saving the world thing, it, but I'm here and I'm not going to waste this life. I want to be here and enjoy it. So, um, yeah, it was very life affirming and, um, there is a follow-up book to it that I forgot what it's called. I started it. But I started it immediately after finishing the first one, and then I just realized, whoa, 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 you know what? I actually do need to just, like, get some space from this because it was an experience reading that first book. So the second one is called Destiny of Souls. I'm not expecting to love it as much as the first one. Um, I'm just telling you, that first one, it is a trip. And I, yeah, I, I really just kind of needed the break. And like I said, I think because I came out of it with this feeling of like, I'm glad to be alive in this form. Um, I think I was ready to like take my head out of the spiritual world for a time and really be grounded here in the here and now. And I feel like those are messages that come through in my tarot readings and my meditations often to be here and be present. Like, yes, have, have that connection, not forget my inner divinity and, and that, that soulful side of myself. Of course not, but there's a reason why I am here in this body. And so figure out what that is and do it. But anyway, while I was reading through that, and was just like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I ended up grabbing a few decks. Um, I, there's this one room I would sit and read in. And, and so I just kept the decks on the table there because I knew that there now and then there'd be something that would spur me to just want to put my candle down and grab the decks and do a reading. Just like different questions that it was rise, uh, like raising for me. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.